now we are going to start classification of communication. Till now you have learnt that effective communication is the life and blood of an organization as well as of an individual also. But then the need is to know what are the various forms of communication and for that it is actually the nature of communication which allows us to classify communication into different categories. As we discussed earlier, you can communicate in different ways that may vary depending upon the need, the suitability and the purpose of communication. For example, in day to day life when you are communicating, you either communicate by speaking, speaking to a person face to face, talking to somebody over telephone, chatting sometimes, sending emails, writing letters, writing research papers, proposals and many such things. But for all these, we can categorize this communication and classify. But before we do that, because all of us know that communication can either be oral or it can be written. Now, what is the basic difference and how the one has an advantage over the other? Today, when we talk to people, you will find even though writing has come to take a secondary role, but whenever we require records, it is the writing that works. Writing is varied and depending upon the purpose, its nature also varies. But when we talk and if you want to understand the difference, you write to a person and you talk to a person, you can understand that when you talk to a person, you feel you derive more warmth than you write to a person. Because when you write, you are actually waiting and you are waiting for the response and the feedback is most often delayed. But when you are speaking, you speak spontaneously. You are having a face to face communication and then your listeners or your audience are in front of you. So, sometimes if you speak some such words or if you give some such illustrations or references, you also have a chance to give flat clarifications. But when it is writing, it actually becomes difficult. And then by the time you send the information again, there may be a delay. So, an oral communication is more spontaneous, a writing is actually organized. And when you speak, you use different sort of sentences and because you have the facility of voice, you can also convey your emotions through that. But in writing, this is not possible. Writing actually is a complex process. And it has to be organized in a variety of ways. When we speak, we can speak informally, we can also speak formally, but when you write as it becomes a sort of record, you have to be very formal. Of course, there are certain structures also that you have to follow when you are writing. Moreover, when you write, you have to follow some standards standards of grammar, standards and correctness of grammar, you also have to see, you actually have to think what impact it will have once it reaches the audience. Hence, writing is more intricate, it is more complex. And moreover, 
when you speak, you actually have a small group, sometimes a large group, but writing has, a, has an advantage that it can cover a large audience spread out across the world. There are various oral forms that you also communicate and these are briefing. You sometimes are invited to deliver a talk, you are to deliver a speech, you are to participate in a group discussion, you are to present a paper in a seminar or conference or a symposium. Moreover, you can also participate in certain meetings, interviews, you can also speak telephonically. But in all these situations, when you are communicating, you are actually to see how your words play a vital role, how you select your words. Moreover, as oral has the facility of clarification, you can also improvise, but once you have written something and sent, it becomes difficult to change. You cannot, you do not have the facility of deleting, which you have of course, when you are writing an electronic mail. But how many of us really revise the writing that we are going to send? Electronic gadgets have made us so impatient that the moment we write, we want to send it very quickly. And sometimes because of that uh, promptness, we sometimes create some spelling lapses and give a message to the other about our hurry. Hence, we have to be very careful when we are writing. But when you are writing, as I said, it is a complex process. It has certain variations also because you write for various purposes. If you are writing for business, you will find that you come across writing letters, reports, you sometimes also write memos and notices just in order that your employees are informed. You also have newsletters, circulars, brochure and research paper. Now, all these as in the previous module we discussed, they actually are a part of organizational communication, but when you are writing them, you have to be very careful because this may become a part of your policy statement, policy document and since you have to abide by the company or the organization laws, hence you need to see that it does not bring a bad effect, not only on your employees, but on customers and clients as well. Here, it is of quite importance that we understand the various forms of human communications, because whether you communicate outside the organization or inside the organization, you are actually to deal with humans. Now, when humans communicate, there are at least four ways depending upon the number of participants, we can always say that humans may communicate intrapersonally, at times they may communicate intrapersonally, they may also communicate interpersonally, sometimes we can have an extra personal communication and sometimes because we are living in an age where we are surrounded by all sorts of gadgets, we can also have a mass and media communication. Now, when you are communicating intrapersonally, so as the word goes, intrapersonal is a communication within. Whether it is an intrapersonal communication in the organization or it is an intrapersonal communication for an individual, you will find a person also communicates with himself. We have said in one of the modules that communication is a two-way process. But then you may ask a question, how when we have an intrapersonal communication, how there are two parties? Of course, you are communicating with yourself, but then there is an electrochemical and electrotechnical process which goes within you 
and you find that your eyes become the transmitter of the message and the central nervous system becomes the medium. Now what you do is the electrochemical process of the body they actually generate the communication and finally your brain which acts as the receiver gives the feedback in the form of either the shrinking of the muscles, tightening of your jaws and some other bodily reactions also. So there are many situations where you are communicating intrapersonally and intrapersonal communication helps you discover yourself at time. Suppose you missed a good grade in the examination and you are very unhappy, but if you communicate interpersonally, you will find that there were certain lapses also and then you can come to realize that if you could have applied some of these methodologies, perhaps you have done well. So you talk to yourself, you communicated with yourself and finally you find that you came out with a sort of assumption that if others can do, I can also do. Sometimes you will also find that many uh, plays have given description of many actors who are actually speaking to themselves that are in the form of soliloquies or that are in the form of a sight. So they communicate with themselves. One such is uh, an example from Hamlet where the character says to be or not to be that is the question that is actually a part of soliloquy. So soliloquy is also a part of intrapersonal communication. So when you are communicating intrapersonally it is actually a sort of realization and at the same time a sort of recovery. But then now we move to interpersonal communication. Interpersonal communication is between two parties two individuals sometimes between two groups and that is in the form of conversation. Conversation is an art which all of us are not able to have it. You have to develop and when you are having a sort of conversation you will find as in the process of communication we have said we have to understand the background of the receiver so that we can communicate in such a manner that the conversation becomes a really cherishable experience. The dialogue, the word dialogue itself says it is actually a sort of communication between the two. Of course, interview is also a part of your interpersonal communication. When you, as I said, it is between two parties. Sometimes you may be one party and three or four people may form one another party. So that is when you are appearing at the interview it can be a sort of interpersonal communication and interpersonal communication can also be called dyadic communication because it involves two parties. In order to make this communication successful, there are certain factors which are responsible. For example, if you are working in an organization, your interpersonal communication depends upon the sort of relationship that you maintain with your boss. So one author has gone to the extent of saying that interpersonal communication is a sort of relationship communication. So when you communicate something, say for example, you are communicating in order to convey a message and the reaction of the message or the response to the message will definitely depend upon the sort of relationship that you are having with the receiver or in this case with the boss or the person who is at the helm of the affair. Next is extra personal communication. As we said, it is not only humans who communicate, animals also communicate. Of course, animals do not have the facility of language. You will or you might have realized, you might have read that all of us were not able to communicate and in earlier days animals used to communicate by chattering as, as we all know they chatter. Sometimes or the other they make movements, they actually create sounds. We have an advantage that our sounds are meaningful but then 
The sounds that are made by animals are also not meaningless, it is for us to understand. So, animals also express their desire or they communicate either by making sounds, by wagging their tails, by raising their mouth or by making unnecessary movements if they are tied to a post. But when we talk of extra personal communication, humans can also communicate with animals even though you may use words. The response you may not get in the form of words, but through movements or through some of other activities they show that they can understand your communication. The response in such case always may be through their bodily movements. It is very difficult though at times to understand the meaning that they convey through some of the movements. Then you most often come across group communication. A group communication is a communication that is often conducted among the members of a group, sometimes a large group. Say for example, when I am delivering a lecture in a classroom, I am having a sort of group communication and when there is a group communication, there is no immediate response, but then there is less chance of interaction also because sometimes it may appear to be one sided, but then when there are small group communications, say for example, when it is a GD, you will find that all the members of the GD, they communicate with each other and there is a sort of exchange, but then there are other ways also when there is actually a meeting or there is a discussion, fine. But then all these are guided by some amount of formalities. Say for example, in a meeting, every member has a chance, but you will often find not everyone contributes to the discussion. There are some people who often remain silent, but then through their silences also, they are communicating. It is for us to understand what they communicate or it is for us to derive what may be the meaning of their sudden silence or of their less participation. We shall discuss at large about group communication when we talk about the dynamics of group discussion in some other module. Next is a mass and media communication. This communication is often with the help of electrical and mechanical devices. Most of the time when you read newspaper which has actually a coverage of large number of people. In such communications, you may not find that there is a sort of active participation, but then the receiver is always supposed to be passive when somebody reads a newspaper or when you are listening to some program over the television or you are talking to or somebody is delivering a talk, all these are the examples of mass and media communication. It may be three different ways and receiver in such a case has a less chance of either seeking clarification or they also feel that there is some amount of lacking so far as the personal rapport is concerned. It is very difficult for the speaker or the sender to have a control over the wide variety of people spread when he or she is communicating with the help of mass and media communication. But remember, in order to make these communication situations effective, it is for the sender to use words in which there is a sort of participation or in which there is a sort of interest shown towards the listeners, though listeners in such situations often have a less chance to have a personal rapport. But on many occasions you will find when communication is also based on medium. Say for example, we all know that all sorts of communication are verbal because whether you speak or write, you use words. Of course, as I said earlier, when you are using words, you have to be very selective, you have to be very specific, you have to see whether 
the intended meaning because when when you are sending the meaning the meaning is not with the words rather the meaning lies with the sender it is for the sender to decide depending upon the background knowledge of the receiver so any communication is always verbal and when it is verbal it will be of words whether it is spoken or written but then to say that verbal communication alone is a communication will be a hasty statement communication also can be non verbal for example you will find if you watch a movie or a theater you will find the characters they speak but at the same time they display they display their body movements they display other nuances and in certain cases you will find that the dialogue that they have delivered that is actually to be supplemented by their non verbal cues when we talk about non verbal cues these non verbal cues are more than 6 lakh in number it is very difficult uh, to catalog to number all of them but in some of the coming lectures when we discuss non verbal communication or communicating without words will categorize them and we find that the non verbal communication the non verbal cues they are more apparent it is always said that whatever you say it is always written on your face the feelings that you generate through your words in some way or the other they are visible on your face it is for other party so when you have a face to face communication you are not only listening to the words of the sender but at the same time you are watching the movements the bodily movements of the sender and through that by combining both their verbal and non verbal you are actually deriving a sort of meaning then we have a meta communication this meta communication is beyond words sometimes many people very diligently very subtly very carefully they actually sometimes they are unintentional also for example somebody may speak a sentence but he may not understand that some word that he used may have a different meaning for some other purpose for some other person so meta communication is a communication where people can find unintentional meanings of certain words every sentence that you speak because you know words are very tricky and you do not know the way you are using words if it is to be interpreted by the other party whether it is interpreted in the same way or not that is very difficult hence you have to be very careful when you are having a sort of meta communication then comes the print and electronic media nowadays uh, most of the time people say that they are more accustomed to electronic media does that mean that books are not being written does that also mean uh, that people have lost their passion for reading books whatever you may say but the written word always have its own importance and that is why the newspaper readers every day you will find they are increasing it is not decreasing and even if, even when they are reading the printed one others also those who do not read the printed one they are actually reading it electronically and there also it is the written communication that is to follow so when we talk about the print and electronic media there are different ways and when you are communicate you also find there are different ways and forms that you communicate you may communicate by writing an email you may communicate uh, by chatting nowadays there are several opportunities and you have options available you are living in a digital world but remember what you are writing today it may have in at some point of the time because when you write you are writing just for seeking a sort of satisfaction but you never understand what may be the interpretation sometimes many people who have actually a fascination of writing over electronic media they do not bother what impact will it have in times of crisis and it is very difficult hence one has to be 
aware of it, what he or she has written. Now, another way of communication is cross-cultural communication. In a cross-cultural communication, as we are living in a world where people of different cultures gather at one organization or at a, at a common platform, it is very essential that when you are communicating, even though for a specific purpose, you have to respect the religious sentiments, you have to respect the etiquettes because etiquettes, tastes, habits, even, even you know, the time mannerism that also varies. We are living in a global world and in a global world, there are many other things to be taken care of. There are many people who actually value that when you are communicating, it is the status that marks. In organizations, you know, there is a set pattern of who can communicate to whom. And sometimes people also, people at the top level, sometimes may have a sort of attitude. And you know, in order to succeed today, if there are attitudinal classes between the manager and the other employees, this may really lead to a sort of bad reputation. And the reputation of the organization may sink. Hence, it is advisable that when you are communicating either globally or you are communicating cross-culturally, you have to value. Remember that sometimes time plays a vital role. You must not wonder that if you are in Latin America and you find the meeting does not begin at time, there is no wonder because it is the practice in Latin America that before the meeting they have a lot of discussion, they eat and then they start the meeting. Moreover, the exchange of gifts, the exchange of presents that also may create a problem. If you are going to present a Chinese with a clock, he or she may think that you are inviting evil for him. Hence, globally, when you are communicating, you have to be very cautious. Moreover, your social behavior, because humans have a tendency as well as a weakness. They always think that whatever they understand, whatever their culture says is the same the world over. But it is not so. In order to make yourself free from all such differences, it is always better to allow more room to the receivers. And then you will find that you have been able to maintain a sort of decorum. Nowadays, there are also ethical aspects to be taken care of when you are communicating either in an organization or globally. You will find that every organization has got an ethical code and it is the ethical code that guides all employees either through policy statements and every individual when he or she works in an organization has to see that they are maintaining their personal ethics also. Say for example, if somebody is traveling at the cost of one's organization and entertaining an interview, that may be considered unethical. So long as you are in the organization, you must respect the values, the sentiments, the ethical codes, the policy statements of the organization that you are working in. There are also public messages which are sometimes on the company websites, they also from time to time guide you and warn you about certain policies and procedure. Hence, as a responsible citizen, you need to see that you maintain the decorum and the dignity of the organization. Now, in an age today where there is freedom of speech, the legal path also is to be taken care of. Every organization expects and ensures a sort of fairness and integrity in an age when you are either misquoting or you are passing an inaccurate piece of information or you are maintaining a policy and then some way or the other because of some sort of helplessness or the other, if things go awry, you may always be asked, the organization be always may be asked and there may at times be legal hassles. In order to avoid such things, it is better not to misquote, nor to plagiarize, meaning thereby when you are quoting somebody, you are to refer to, you are to acknowledge. Sometimes when you go outside, it has been seen that many of our immature young guys, when they are changing jobs 
and when they are responding to certain questions which are of very critical nature, they either criticize the organization that they are in simply to get a job, but this may be called unethical, this may also be called illegal. Dear friends, it is always better to see that you are an ambassador of the organization that you are working in and hence when you criticize if it is in the form of writing it may be called libel or when you are doing it in the form of speaking it may be called a slander. So slanderous remarks ought to be avoided in order because we have discussed that in order to survive today you have to be an effective communicator and an effective communicator is one who actually tries to harmonize, who actually tries to create a sort of blend, create a sort of blending of his behavior, social graces, his integrity and the fairness that he is having and that allows him to consider himself responsible for what he says both inside the organization and outside the organization. You will realize through these lectures that soft skills which are an important asset today and people having these soft skills are the much sought after by organizations and employers. Hence my sound advice to you all is communicate, communicate with a purpose, communicate with a meaning, communicate to bind not to divide, communicate to harmonize, communicate to work for a specific goal of the organization. Thank you very much.